Uh, and I'm pleased to say we're joined online by Chris Making. Good evening, Chris. How are you? Good evening, boys. How are we? Not too bad. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Hi. Good evening. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Chris uh, in a minute because he's been asking all over Twitter. I know you've been retweeting it as well for questions about tonight. Uh, trying yeah. to get as many as we can for Sun from uh, the Sunderland fans and, and things like yeah. that. Um, what I want to know, Chris, is what you're up to now. I believe you're in Doha working uh, working for TV out there. Yeah, well, that, at the moment I'm on the couch back in Manchester. <laughs> I've come home for a few days just to tie a little bit of business up and see my family. But I'm working for a TV company called Alcast TV. Uh, they're based in Doha, which is in Qatar. I work with uh, Rodri Williams, who's a, a former presenter of uh, Sky. Sky Sports and I'm with uh, Nicky Summerby as well um, Jim McGilton was out there last year with us but he's unfortunately he, he's relocated back to Belfast uh, unfortunate for us but fortunately for the Northern Irish FA because he's like I think his task is to produce more kids for Northern Ireland which right. will be which I think is a thankless task yeah yeah which uh, yeah it's really it's, you know it's really good over there in, in Doha and Qatar and um, last week was really that was something special because uh, all the TV crews were out there. CNN did a big uh, news bulletin on why they should have the World Cup and why they shouldn't have the World Cup. So it's a really interesting time out there at the moment. Mm -hmm. So what's your opinion on the World Cup? Because obviously it's caused so much controversy back here. Uh, yeah. with, uh, should it be in the winter? Should it be in the summer? Would it be safe to have it in the summer? What, what's your take on it from, from sort of the point of view of being out there? Yeah, my take is, I mean... <sighs> The, the, what it is in the local league there the QSL which is the Qatar Stars League some of the stadiums at the moment have air conditioned uh, units in it so the players seem to like that I don't think that, I think we're looking at it from a World Cup point of view we're looking at it from a spectator's point mm -hmm. of view the players I don't think they'll have a problem because there's going to be air conditioned stadiums um, uh, Nicky Summerby made a good point when he was interviewed by CNN He's a, Francis Lee's a very close friend of their family he said when they went to the World Cup in Mexico in 1970 they played uh, in 110 degrees heat and without any water you only got water before the match half time and after, and after the match so the temperatures are going to be similar to that but you know the, the players get looked after a lot more nowadays so yeah. I don't think it's from a player's point of view while the you know, if there's going to be trouble in, in the summer heat, I think that's more for the supporters. Um, and then the other debate is for, for the, for the uh, if it's going to be a, a summer World Cup or a winter uh, uh, World Cup, is is due to the pressure from the different leagues in Europe. Obviously, if it is a winter World Cup, it's going to have massive impact on the the Premier League. Ex exactly. Um, you know, we don't obviously, as you're aware, we don't have the winter break. I mean. How, how big of an impact would you see that having in the Premier League? Do you think we'd take a break and just play on longer into the summer? Well, I think... Uh, I mean, I just got off the experts on television, or so-called experts, and they reckon it's going to take another two, you know, another two, three years to get back to normal. So, for me, when I, when I talk to people in Qatar and, and very high-up people, they're adamant and they're confident that, you know, they can stage a, mm -hmm. a, a Summer World Cup. Now, at the moment, when we're out there, the, the infrastructure is just going in now yeah. in terms of motorways, roads, the monorail. Um, they haven't actually started work on, on the on the stadium. But the, 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 the uh, infrastructure is going in now at the moment and, you know, it's an incredible place to be around and seeing the change that's going on in the city and, and you know, in Qatar. So, I mean, they're fairly comf uh, comfortable with the idea that they can stage a World Cup in the summer whether that involves fan zones that are air conditioned. I mean, everyone's going on about, you know, the fans, will they be walking around the streets? And so, well, nobody walks around the streets of Doha in the summer. I know because all, all the bars and all the restaurants are in top class hotels. It, it, it reminds me a little bit of Las Vegas, you know, where yeah. you don't really walk the streets. Anyhow, you're always in and out of the hotels and going in and out of the bars. So, I mean, if they've got the monorail and, and people Doha's not that big as well so people will be getting taxis and buses about I don't think there have been that many people in that walking the streets in that heat anyhow mm -hmm. I think the big debate is w whether it's going to impact on the European leagues especially the Premier League yeah I mean we, we were talking because Chris is a, a Manchester United fan I'm a Liverpool fan 
uh, well, and a couple of the I other guys should, who uh, maybe I should talk to Chris because I'm a United fan. I don't <laughs> want to talk to him. <laughs> uh, when you were playing, Chris, did you ever think about having a break over the Christmas period? I know. I mean, from my point of view, Boxing Day growing up was a no. massive day. You get Christmas Day out of the way and get down to football the day after. It was fantastic. But is it something yeah. you ever thought about? No, no. Like I was saying, sorry, before we got cut up. Uh, cut up. Um, not as players, no. In them days, I think Boxing Day was the, uh, probably used to get the biggest crowds of the season in on, on a Boxing Day for, for punters, mm. probably apart from the opening day of the season. And as players, it, you know, we used to love playing over Christmas. It was, it was, it was. A t- I know there was a lot of games, and it was in such a short span of time. But it was, t- it was time if you had a good run of form or a good run of results, and you could pick up a load of points quite quickly. So yeah. Yeah. it was, it was never debated, never, never talked about. Uh, I was just saying a minute ago, the, the first uh, midweek winter break I had was when I went to Marseille, and I think we had two or three, uh, two or three weeks off. So that was my first taste of it, and I, f- I found it quite difficult, actually. You just mentioned um, playing for Marseille there, and before yeah. I uh, before I pass over to Chris, um, yeah. we've had an, an email in from one of our from one of our listeners who has yeah. asked. Um, I'm just going to find the email. Sorry about this. It's okay. Um, it's from Stu Curtin. Um, he's asked: Was there much difference in the tactics, the formation, and the coaching techniques between? Um, playing at Marseille and playing, say, Sunderland and at Oldham before yeah. that. Yeah, it was just the sheer pace of the game. You know, it just goes down a notch. I think what I found difficult was, well, not found difficult, I soon adapted, but in the in the first two thirds of the field, it was more uh, build up play, trying to get to the last third. But when, when, once you got in the last third, it, it was done with pace, sheer pace. You had to attack mm-hmm. with pace and be creative and, 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 you know, general use of the ball had to be. Uh, quicker. Um, the coaching side was more technical. Um, the training sessions that we was doing in, in Marseille in 1996 um, was far more technical than uh, uh, I'd ever done in, in um, back home in England. So I, I, I loved it. I, re- I really, you know, everything was done at a, a slower pace, but with more emphasis on the technique. And the training sessions were a, a real eye opener. But I loved my year out there. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pass it over to Chris because I know he wants to take a bit more of an in-depth look at your playing career. Yeah. Uh, so over to Cheers, you, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. You okay? Hi. Yeah, I'm great, thanks. Good um, um, I'll take my first question. Was, how did the good people of Marseille find your accent? <laughs> quite a broad your northern accent. <laughs> About, probably the same as you. Um, <laughs> it, it, it was alright. It, it, it was strange once you've thrown, thrown in at the deep end. You've, you've got you've got to learn to swim quickly. When I went over there, I didn't really talk any French apart from what I'd learned at school, which was mm. beyond, really nothing. Very so <laughs> very very basic. And uh, Marseille people are known as having a talking a lot and talking quick and having a strong accent. So when I went to the shops, I just didn't have a clue what they was talking about. So. <laughs> I quickly learned that you know you've got to learn the language. It's so important as a footballer when you move abroad. You've got to, you've got to adapt to their ways, and you got. To, so my main thing was as as well as training as hard as I could was to learn the language as fast as I could. So I just re- you know I had, um, loads of lessons every week and really got into it. Brilliant. Well, so I know last time I went to France, France, I thought I could ask for was it. Pineapple juice because I can remember was hard and it was pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> so you, honestly, you want to go over there because it, it's an it's an absolutely fanatical city in terms of football. Mm. They just um, they're so passionate. If, if I mean, if, if we lost the game, they used to come in the changing rooms, used to kick the cars and be fighting with the police and everything. So we had to win. The most important thing is we had to win our home games. What I mean, they're they're a massive club. It was frightening sometimes. Brilliant. Um, well, first question is for Tedson from one of our forum members, um, Home Blower OA FC. Is that, um, what was it like as a youngster playing for Oldham at their peak and then at the beginning of their slide down the lower league? Um, unbelievable. I mean, I was at Oldham for 10 years since I was about, I left United Centre of Excellence when I was about 12, 13, went to Oldham. Um, and it, it just, Joe Rowe did such an unbelievable job there and the, the club just I won't say it got bigger and bigger, but it just developed as a club. Mm. Well, I think when when I used to go down there as a schoolboy watching 
uh, the first thing he used to get two or three thousand. And, um, by the time I was playing in the Premiership and Premiership with Oldham, I think the average was fifteen thousand. So the, the rise of the football club was unbelievable. And to be part of it was a great experience. It was just it, it, what Joe done there and Willie Donachie was quite incredible. You know, I look, I look back on it with really fondly, great memories there. And, but then I don't think clubs like that can. The size of them uh, clubs like Oldham or maybe like as it sounds like Bolton and Blackburn, can they really sustain it? And Oldham just couldn't sustain it. And then I was part yeah. of the not not the downfall because they were still in the Championship, which is quite a, a good level for Oldham Athletic, you know. But and since then they've been relegated again, and they, they just can't seem to get back to that level. But maybe yeah. you, you look at the history of the club, and maybe it was just a golden. A golden generation, really. What, what Joel done there, I don't. I don't think it'll ever be repeated. No. No, he, he had fantastic sides there, and the the sides that he built, him and Willie Donachie were uh, fantastic. And I'm sure the fans look back and think, Oof, I'd love to see a little bit of that again. Yeah, and then um, after Marseille, you sold to Sunderland for was it, half a million. Yeah, and that season you, you, you took part in probably the, the best playoff final ever in my opinion the four old <laughs> draw for Charlton like so, a five percent um, match <laughs> so um, could you tell us what the what's the day like before the match how do you build up to a playoff the day, final the yeah. day was um, I, I'd, I'd been injured in and out of the side all season and um, I'd just got fit for the semi-finals and you know the uh, the, the, what's it called? The, you know, just before the final, and yeah. I think Darren Holloway was uh, was in the team at the time. Uh, and, you know, there was I think um, I don't know how many subs were on the bench in them days, maybe two or three. So we was all vying to be on on, on the bench and maybe take part in the game. And you know, because it's been Wembley, there's eighty thousand there. Luckily enough, a Premier Fitness and uh, Reedy put me on the bench, and uh, you know, and it was getting beat. I think it was 1-0 at half time and we never played well as a, as a team in the first half and he put me on for the second half and that's what I was thinking about in, in the build up to the game it, you know it, yeah. it's just like any other game really you know you're just you're, you're thinking about what can happen what will happen you know mm. this, this is where the nerves come in and nerves and anticipation are we going to win today if we win you know what a feeling that be we're back in the premiership so the build-up to the game, or for any game, it, it's just a nightmare because you, you, you're trying to look ahead and trying to think of good things, really. You, you put in the back of your mind, you don't know, you like the, the support, you don't know what the, the result's going to be. Um, as it happens on that day, you know, we got beat on penalties and yeah. maybe maybe it was a good thing in eyesight because I don't think as a team or as a, as a squad, we... we if we would have got promoted that day, I don't think we would have done well in the Premiership the following season. Yeah. Um, how did Peter Reid go about the side and the um, penalty takers? Because you weren't known for your prolific score. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you what, he literally went round and we didn't really practice it, to be honest. He literally, mm. literally went round and asked who wanted to take one. And I'd come on at half-time, we'd done all right in the match. You know, I was buzzing with just being... It was the last game of the season. It was a yeah. bit beautiful day. And there was 80,000 there. And I, I just I had it in my mind. I was 25 years old. I just really wanted to make most uh, the most of that day. And I was yeah. just feeling confident. I said, I'll, I said, just give us a penalty. So <laughs> he, he, he went round and asked them. And the ones that took one in the first five, uh, all put their hands up. Hmm. And uh, what's it like uh, walking from the centre circle to take a penalty at Wembley? Is it, yeah, have, you, have, you seen that, have you seen that film, The Green Mile? <laughs> <laughs> like that. <laughs> it's, uh, it was um, phew, it's just it's surreal. You can't really explain it. It's just you know it's like the longest walk ever. And mm. I just I remember taking my shin pads off and. Rolling my socks down, I thought I'll just get a little bit of air to my legs here and try and freshen up yeah. a little bit. It's just the longest walk, Kevin. It's one of them. It, what's so bad about it? It just gives you time to think. And all good penalty yeah. takers always say, get something in your mind and don't deviate it. So if you you know pick a corner in your mind and and, and keep it at 
and um, and that's what I was thinking. I thought, right, I've picked my side. I'm going to go to that side. Don't don't change your mind. Keep going to that side. And um, I try to give uh, Fifth Sasha the leech to keep at the time for Charlton. Yeah. I try to give him the eyes one one way. And, um, I went the other way, but I could see you know, peripheral vision. I could see he's died the right way. I thought, oh, no, he saved it. And he managed to get a hand to it, I think. But I think the sheer power of it took it in. Yeah, don't, laugh at that. don't laugh at that last little bit there. <laughs> no. Right. And then, um, well, unfortunately, you didn't go, you lost on penalties, but the next season, you actually they destroyed Division yeah. 1. I think 105 points, three defeats all season. What was the yeah. most standout moment of the season? The, the, the most standout moment of the following season? Yeah, yeah, that season. Um, was I think. Absolutely destroyed. Yeah, I, f- I think we won. I think we won the championship. At, I think we went to Betty, uh Gig mm. Lane, you know, and you know, you know what a Sunderland fans are like. They're, you know, very some of some might say fanatical. They have three. I think we have three sides of the ground. That was a great night. The, mm. And then I think we won the championship at Barnsley. But then I, I think um, I remember one game at home. I think it was Birmingham, the last game of the season. When yeah, I think I think it was Birmingham, and the whole day was. It was just a celebration, you know. We had the families there, the, the ground was bouncing. So I think it was yeah. more or less the, the last game of the season where <clears throat> everything was wrapped up and you could actually look forward to the Premiership being back in the Premiership. Yeah, and then you had uh, almost two excellent seasons in the Premiership. I think you finished seventh two years yeah. in a row. Yeah. yeah. And then you, um, you moved to Ipswich in yes. 2001. And- and they finished fifth as well so you had three great seasons in a row really didn't you well the, the only regret I have and when, and when we talked to together all the lads that, that we played in that team is we, the, I'm talking about Sunderland now we, we, we yeah. should have played Europe we should have qualified for Europe we was good enough for that uh, for one reason or another we never I think I think we could have um, I don't know what the situation at the time with, was with Peter Reid or um the chairman at the time um, mm. but I, I felt we could have added at certain times maybe got another top class player in or or maybe two I just yeah. I just felt like that, that team we had at Sunderland was good enough to play in, in, in Europe I think Aston Villa beat it was the first season by a point you know and mm. you know it, it's just when they say when people say I have no regrets well, I have a bit of a regret and regret I should have played in Europe that team but anyhow yeah. and then the following season it, you know I was sold to it switching there and they was one of our um, contenders for Europe that year and then yeah. they got to it switching the match and, and we and when we qualified for the UEFA Cup and it, it went down to the last game of the season I think it was also in Liverpool and was it Leeds I think certainly uh, Liverpool was uh, involved in it it went down mm. to the last game of the season where we, we could have finished in the Champions League spot. but to get yeah. the, to get in the UEFA Cup with um, with Vitz, which was um, that was another I think Jenny just been promoted that season I'm trying to remember I mm. think they were they was promoted in 1998 via the playoffs mm. um, oh, right. 98 we went up in 99 no sorry 2000 2000 mm. yeah so yeah the yeah. first season back I think they qualified yeah, it was a remarkable achievement, um, and you know that was another great story as well. And I think uh, you got to the se- I think you got to the, was it the second or third round. You got to wasn't it? And you lost on. I think it was the third round. Yeah, I think we uh, along the way. I think we beat one of the Moscow teams. I can't remember which one it was. Man, yeah. I can't remember where it was. Um, then we beat Helsingborg, which was a very tough place to go, and then we beat. We, we went out eventually to Inter Milan away, but we beat them at home um, at Portman Road, 1-0. Alan yeah. Armstrong scored a penalty. <coughs> Full of uh, great players, Zanetti, um, Seydorf, Adriano was a young player at the time. Uh, and then we played in the, we played the replay in the San Siro, where uh, Eastwich took them out. We had about 10,000 fans there, so that was a great experience. Yeah. Fortunately, we, we got beat 4-1 on the night. Alan Armstrong... Oh. Alan Armstrong scored another penalty. Mm. I think Christian Vieri scored a hat trick that night. He, he was different class, but to play against a top team like that, it was, yeah, it was a great, a great night, a great, a great, um, a great achievement for the club. Yeah, 
Um, if we go on to um, today, was um, some of the points of Poyat. Um, do yeah. you think he's the new Di Canio or is he the saviour? Uh, I don't know what's going on in that club. I can't believe it. I, can't, um, I don't know what's going on. It seems to be Alice's appointment. It seems to be the, 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 I can't remember the director of football's name. Well, it seems to be his appointment, rather. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, what, you know, he, he done well last year keeping him up to Kenny Ob for starters. Mm. So obviously they are going to offer him, you know, an extension or, you know, whatever. So they back him in the summer to the tune of, I think it's 19, 20 million. Which is, you know, 14 players that you've got him. Yeah. yeah, so that's him to the tune of 19, 20 million and sack him after five games. Yeah, that's I think so. Got, you know, I mean, I brought up the point the other day, what if Gus Pyatt loses the next five games, what happens then? We're going to sack him. You know. And it's the first time I've ever seen where you've gone down and you've become favourites to go down now. Since he's been appointed, you were were evens and then you've gone to odds on to be relegated. Well, the the facts of the matter, they're they're in a a relegation battle now. So someone said to me the other day, well, in the present form, can you see him Staying up in the present form, no, they're going to go down. Yeah. Um, so Gus Poyet has got a hell of a job to do there. Uh, has, has he got the experience? No. He's got a similar background to Paolo Di Canio, where he's managed in a lower league. Done quite mm. well. So did Paolo Di Canio, but I've, you know they both never managed in the, in the Premier League before. And I don't care what what experience, yeah, yeah, what experience he had as a player in the Premier League. I'm sure it's. I mean, I've never managed, so I'm sure it's totally different to manage. Yeah. You can't even find that out. And Gus Poyet, as, as much as I wish him all the best and all the luck, and all, all, hopefully he'll keep him up this year, it's just a big question mark for me. I, I, you know, can he handle it at that, at that level? And I, I hope he can. Uh, Paul, have you got any more questions? Um, no, uh, Chris, you've asked all of mine, mate. Um, it's been a pleasure to to have you on tonight, Chris. I'm getting no really problem. confused between the two of you now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, hopefully, you'll, you'll come back on again. Certainly, with your work out in Qatar, it'll be great to sort of get you know a bit more of an insight into the World Cup as it draws nearer. And, of course, um, yeah. know, we'll, we'll get you back on in the show probably. Uh, in the new year and we'll have a look at what the updates are as the infrastructures get put in place um, but, Definitely. but for tonight it's been a pleasure Chris and uh, enjoy the rest of your night cheers boys thank you Chris, thank you Chris. Okay. Okay, boys. Thank you. bye bye